Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. It's all about balance. Chatting with Dr. John Aquaviva, and I was trying to remember, I knew I, I not only endorsed but wrote to Ford for one of his books, but <laughs> I must be getting older. I couldn't remember if it was this one or the one before that was actually his first book. Both are really, really great, and I think if you're a person or deals with young people, or if you even struggle with these issues, because let's be honest, we all do in terms of we're not good enough, we're not thin enough, we're not smart enough, we're not tall enough, yada, 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 and it goes on. His books would be great to have on hand. So the latest book from John is Improving Your Body Image Through Catholic Teaching, How Theology of the Body and Other Church Writings Can Transform Your Life. And I think this would be very helpful. And Dr. John is a professor of exercise science at Wingate University in North Carolina, the author of Raising Kids with a Healthy Body Image, a Guide for Catholic Parents, an active member of the Catholic Speakers Association, a radio host of Faith and Sports on EWTN Affiliate in Charlotte, North Carolina, and a regular guest on many programs about these important issues. And John, good to talk to you again. Happy Advent. Happy Advent to you, Teresa. Thank you for having me. Boy, what timing for this book. Here we are in the Advent season, and people are putting such pressure on themselves and worried about as we get into Christmas and then New Year's. And then, of course, January it must drive you crazy because there's all the answers on how to have the perfect body and body image. They all happen in January when Madison Avenue goes crazy and makes people feel guilty about eating maybe one extra cookie uh, over right. the holiday season. So what did you? What were you thinking when you wrote the second book regarding body image? Actually, the second book uh, on improving your body image is really just an extension. And what I did was, uh, the first book was about 100 pages, and what I talked about was the triggers and this is the one that you did the forward to Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and i wrote all the triggers some of the common triggers like social media and the internet and movies and discussions that we have with one another especially when people are younger like teenagers and how they discuss everyday matters including their own bodies with one another um and then so i I ended the book with the answers through our faith like uh, how prayer and how confession and how the eucharist and so forth all tied directly into this. And then what I do is throughout the books, I weave Theology of the Body, JP2's great series of discussions on that, the you know, we were embodied for a reason and so forth. And so what I did was uh, over the past year, in fact, it was about a year ago, I was reflecting on this current book that came out, the one we're referring to five years ago. And I said, I want to make this more engaging for the reader. I want to make this more experiential, I want to have them identify more specific things, like the triggers for them particularly. So what I did is I came up with a series of what I call activities, and they're like one- to two-page activities to engage the young adult, preferably like anywhere between middle school and probably the age of 30 they would find these activities helpful. And then I proposed this to Tan, and what they said, they go, let's combine the activities with this former book of yours. And so they adopted the book. And now it's just a longer book, but it's just more engaging, more experiential. And it's one thing to read this stuff, one thing to hear about this. But as a professor of 20 years, one of the things that we always reflect on is try to make the experience in the classroom more engaging for the student. And that's exactly what I did here. So there's 20 different activities. It uh, is experiential. They're involved. They're involved by themselves, or they can do it in groups. It could be led by a teacher, like in CCD or Faith Formation, or they can do it on their on their own. And I'm just so appreciative of Tan, and I know you are appreciative of those folks as well. And yes, absolutely. They just, did a, they, mm-hmm. they just did a great job of putting this all together. So for the for the consumer that may be thinking this uh, this title sounds similar, it's actually the exact same title. It's just that in the, it's an extended version of the first one. That and and uh, the good news is is you still are in there as the forward writer. Oh well, is that nice to know? I, I don't, yeah, I, I don't think all. I have a copy of the book yet. I know it's it's just recently come out, but the book is improving your body image through Catholic teaching. How Theology of the Body and Other Church Writings Can Transform Your Life. We're chatting on a Monday morning with Dr. John Aquaviva. Now, John, I know um, you were talking about young people, but isn't can't we all be a student of this, and shouldn't we all be a student? Because, come on, let's face it, we're all hard on ourselves all the time. That's right. 
No, there's no there's no question about it. The the research as uh, you know over the past 30 years especially there's study after study, survey after stir, survey after survey shows that people of all ages struggle with this. The good news is is as we age it tends to be less of a factor, but the fact is it's still a factor and you're right, it's not just the writings and the teachings of JP2 and and the catechism in which they talk about why we are embodied and so forth. All that has meaning to people of any age. And women tend to be more hard on themselves than men. I don't think that's a surprise to anybody, especially at younger ages. Um, about uh, anywhere between 50 to 70% of women struggle, have some body image issues. And then that number for men is around 33%. And the amazing thing about that 33% is 15, 20 years ago, that number was about 10%. Yeah, In I was just going to say, it's much higher now. Among men That's right, than it was. And, yeah. and I don't think this would be a surprise. It's because what you mentioned earlier, Madison Avenue found they're like, oh my gosh, there's a whole different set of people that we can make feel bad about their bodies, and all this, everything from cologne to deodorant uh, to even soap has been geared at men, and of course, hair products and all that stuff. And it took them a long time to jump on that boat, but they finally did. And as a result, it made men look at themselves through a uh, bigger microscope. How much of this, and, and, and I know you discuss this in the book, but I think this is an important point to make. How much of this, or question to address, I should say, is the attack on the dignity of the human person? Because let's face it, if you're attacking yourself, you're attacking a child of God. And I'm sorry, I think there's a spiritual component to this big time. No, there's a major spiritual component. I'm going to go back uh, about a year. Um, There was a magazine that I saw at somebody else's house, actually. And, you know, it was something like, um, you know, it's an everyday magazine, like Good Housekeeping or a similar magazine, generally geared for women. And on the cover, it said something about, you know, improve your body image. And, of course, that caught me. It might have been written in, you know, it might have, might have, might have, it should have been just the size of the book itself or the magazine itself. It just jumped out at me. So I immediately went to that page. And in this, like, two- or three-page article, they mentioned all the triggers. And, of course, they were speaking my language. This is this mirrored what I wrote in the book and so forth. But ultimately, was they, what they did was they stopped short of any spiritual component. They didn't mention God. They didn't mention the reason we were embodied. And I thought, up until that point, these people did a great job, especially, you know, simplifying it in two or three pages. But, of course, they fell short on the most important aspect, which is, what does God have to say about this? Like, culture has said so much about who we should be, what should we look like, and all these list of things. But God has something to say about this as well. It starts in the Catechism. It's been around for hundreds of years, this, these writings. But really what came... When this really came to life was through JP2's discussions that he had, and it was a series of 100-plus talks that is now termed Theology of the Body. And you and your listeners that are familiar and faithful to JP2's writings are familiar with this, and you guys might remember that it was primarily geared toward the human person in the state of marriage. Like, this is a man's role in marriage, and physically, this is what he did. But what I did is I took those teachings... And I kind of just pulled back and said, well, there's an overall general view that we can have of the human body as well. And that's what I did in this book. And I just tried to elaborate so it spoke to the young reader and the old reader alike. You know, it's so confusing. We were talking about this during the break before we came on, that on the one hand, you see things like we mentioned the Peloton commercial and how they're, they believe that was fat shaming and all of that, where the, the right. guy brought his wife, uh, you know, the bike and, and you know, after she had a baby, I guess, or something. And, you know, this huge controversy. And at the same time, yeah. there's so much pressure for women to be, if, if you're a size zero now, you're considered a little bit overweight. I mean, it's crazy. <laughs> I mean, in terms of so many of these women looking on, and I say women, even men too now, but I say more so, especially with the hotel tour and some of these you know um runway models and there's been yeah. a whole study and a whole thing on this now there there are some companies that are using women who are a normal size uh that right. in, in advertising which i think is great but in back of our minds i think a lot of us are saying oh she looks fat or he looks fat right. if, if you're not a, a particular if, if you're not if your bones aren't sticking out in all places 
That's right. In fact, uh, you, you'll appreciate this because uh, the beloved Justin Verlander, longtime pitcher of the Detroit Tigers, now with the yeah. Houston Astros, right. mm-hmm. he's, he's married to uh, Kate Upton, right? She's right. a model. Mm-hmm. a model and just a beautiful, truly beautiful gal. And um, one of my colleagues met, you know, saw her on a commercial or something and was watching TV with his college age son. And it, the father said something like, now that's a beautiful woman. And he was just being objective and he was being complimentary. And immediately his son, and he told me this directly, my colleague, because of my study and body image and so forth. His son said, she is pretty, but she's kind of fat. And oh I thought goodness. that, yeah, that Kate goes right Upton. with what you're, yes. Kate Upton yeah. is kind of fat. Well, then there's no hope for any of us. <laughs> I thought that was crazy. But, yeah, this is part of the culture we live in. This is the reality of it. And it's just a darn shame that people like that, even folks like that, are just considered, if they're not, if they don't weigh 10 pounds less than what they should, they're considered overweight. And it just shows just how far our culture is going. And how much work we have to do. More with John Equaviva and his book, Improving Your Bobby Image Through Catholic Teaching, when we come back. If you have a question, maybe you want to share a story about your own dealing with this issue, 877-573-7825. Dr. Ecoviva is a professor of exercise science at Wingate University in the beautiful state of North Carolina and the author of another great book, Raising Kids with a Healthy Body Image, A Guide for Catholic Parents. He is an active member of Catholic Speakers, and he also has a show on the radio affiliate in Charlotte, Faith and Sports, on EWTN. 877-573-7825, 877-573-7825. All right, let's talk about wardrobe. Uh, you and I were talking about this during the break, and, and this is yep. a big area of interest for me. So what are you covering? What do you mean when you say a review of your wardrobe that will help you be content with your body type? Well, certainly to, to dress appropriately in all occasions. And, uh, you know, we have to take a look in the mirror, not just literally, but, but uh, kind of spiritually when we're going somewhere. And one of the big um, points of, of interest for a lot of people that they happen to notice is, for instance, when we go to Mass, or we, go, we go somewhere where um, most modest dress is most appropriate. And ultimately, when we go to Mass and we see young ladies or, or guys dressing immodestly, and it seems like one or two things, that they put no thought into it or they just got out of bed and they ran to church, which is generally not the case. It is for some, certainly. But, but usually what it is, there's probably some conscious effort to attract another, even through Mass, because their daily life, you know, their social life, when they're at school or work or out and about on a Friday or Saturday night, often the young person and even older people, um, 30s and 40s are as guilty as this as anybody, especially if they're single, I think. And it's to attract another. And, and so there's more skin that should be being shown, more body parts that are being shown that that would not be defined as, as modest. And, and that's something that these folks need to take a look at and and ultimately you know to to respect the people that are at that church i remember my wife one time when this you know these couple gals young gals high schoolers probably walked up to communion and thankfully i didn't even notice it but after mass my wife alicia mentioned that and she said boy they have you know somebody has to tell them they have to come to the realization that there are men in that congregation that are trying to truly be holy at that moment they're trying to be to gain in their spiritual life and there's somebody that is purposely distracting them from doing that and i think that could be carried on to to daily life men and women are trying to be holy in their thoughts trying to be holy in their actions and then when these gals and guys do that to try to attract another and to try to stimulate them in some regard that they're at fault to a degree in other words they are having impact on these people's spiritual lives. And that point alone, I think, maybe could help people walk down the road of being more holy themselves. Is it, is it maybe that they don't know, they haven't been taught or haven't been, been introduced to, to the appropriate way to dress? Because I think it would be good to put out some suggestions for people. No, there's no question. In fact, that was the real the, uh, big purpose of the second book I wrote, the one that you mentioned a couple times, for Catholic parents, you know, raising kids with a healthy body image, that it's up to the parent to educate them and to tutor them along 
on appropriate dress at really young ages. You know, um, we have a, a friend of the family whose two daughters are in dance, and and from the time that they're really young, they would they would dress very immodestly for these dance competitions. And I remember my wife at one time said. What are they going to tell them when they turn, you know, a certain age, like, say, 13 or 14, when that dress starts to become even more appropriate in their circles and so forth? And I thought that was a great point. Like, at some point, you're going to have to stop that, and and the, it's the parent's job to, you know, create modest um, attire and to, and to create discussions that show them right from the beginning rather than saying, okay, now that you're 16, you have to dress this way. It starts a lot. It starts a lot, you know, or it starts years before that. And it's up to the parents. As so many times, right, the catechism talks to us, Teresa, about that the first teachers of the faith are the parents. And this is part of it, is that the way we dress and the, and, and the fact that some of these young gals and girls are just constantly after stimulating another visually and that has to be taught at a young age and it has to be taught, um, I think, on a regular basis. Yeah, absolutely. Let's go to the phones. Jane calling from Central Illinois on line two has a good question. Hey, Jane, good morning. Happy Advent. What's on your mind this morning? Yes, good morning. So I appreciate what you just said. That's not why I called in, but that's exactly why we had to take our daughter out of dance because we were seeing the writing on the wall. They were really cute when they were little. But then as yep. they got older and older, they were doing more suggestive dancing, less clothes, and so anyway. But the reason for my call was actually I am of average, above average weight for my height, mm-hmm. But and, mm-hmm. and I've been under a food microscope from my folks since I was a child. But what I'm wondering is there is definitely a difference in the culture just not only the shaming, but also the fact that we are a bigger culture. And I'm not, I mean, I'm part of that. But when I was a child, I'm 57, you mm-hmm. might have had one slightly overweight boy and girl in the class, and that was That's it. That's right. So what right. is, is this because, you know, there's so much... I always wonder, is, does abortion play into this? It may sound crazy. You know, that's a really interesting says, point that you mentioned. That my, my, I don't want to interrupt you, but I did want to mention this, though, Jane, because you mentioned talking about the fallout from abortion and so many, so much woundedness because there's so many people that right. are impacted by it. And so it could be, right. you know, a self deprecating yeah, thing. Where, self-medicate. Yeah, self-medicate. Yeah, self-medicate. Yeah, and yeah. I, I just, I've always wondered about that. And not, again, I'm not... I mean, I'm not looking down because I'm... No, I'm, and, I and I think, too, it's, it's, we all struggle. And also, Jane, you're, this is a point because we know obesity is a huge problem. So we're not, nobody's denying that. But, but I think you know, what you're saying is what, what's causing it, what are the issues, right. which is why we're having John on. And also, there always has to be a balance. So, so John, she brings up a couple of really good points. And, oh, we have about two minutes. So, uh, Jane, yeah, thanks. Right. I, I apologize for interrupting, but I wanted to, to, to get him uh, to, to address this and kind of summarize. Go ahead, John. No, I, I agree that there's a certain wounded, woundedness out there, and people see. I mean, there's a term called comfort food, right? And people turn to it when they're depressed, when they're down. And there's a lot of ups and downs in our lives, and that's of course going to mean if there's a lot of downs in our lives, and we turn to food when we're down, that means it's going to directly lead to the to the obesity crisis that we're seeing now. Um, but there's a there's a bigger picture here, and of course, it's not all understood. And I think this is frustrating, maybe to the listener to hear this, but we don't quite know exactly what why people turn uh, exactly to either under eating or overeating, at least not in all costs. We do know, though, that there's an important concept. It's called the social comparison theory. The more we look at images in a magazine, in a movie, in a video, and so forth, the more we reflect on those videos and those pictures, and the more we compare ourselves to them. Yeah. And this is one of the reasons why I strongly suggest to limit the magazines that we have on our kitchen table for our teenagers and our young people in our, in our lives, and that we limit and control what we watch on TV and videos, because that is the single biggest factor here that we have to consider. Absolutely, John. Yeah, great, great points. And so much more in the book, uh, Dr. John Aquaviva. And if you'd like more information, we will have the links on our archive section at Catholic Connection and AveMariaRadio.net. But again, the book is Improving Your Body Image Through Catholic Teaching. Our guest has been Dr. John Aquaviva. We'll be right back with the one the only Raymond Arroyo on a Monday morning edition of Catholic Connection. Stay tuned.
Hello, God's Beloved. I'm Annabelle Mosley, author, professor of theology, and host of Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. I invite you to listen in and find inspiration along this sacred journey we're traveling together to make our lives a masterpiece and, with God's grace, become saints. Join me, Annabelle Mosley, for Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. God bless you. Remember, you're never alone. God is always with you. We hope you enjoyed the program and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.